Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're nearly there. Last session, so I hope you lunched well, networked well. Um, we had a good morning with um, our uh, presentation and demonstration from Martin from KLM on slot swapping and also on how to uh, take those opportunities uh, that are available. I think there was some good workflow tips there and some good questions as well. I was then followed up from uh, Sebastian with uh, uh, the ACDM. The feedback that I've heard from people is, bloody hell, that's a complicated subject, but actually Sebastian made it as clear as, uh, as we've heard it in a long while. And I think that's a, quite a compliment because it is a difficult subject. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a nice demonstration, a, a good presentation, and some good questions as well. So thank you very much for that. So this afternoon, we've got um, three sessions. Um, as I said before, our colleague from Swiss uh, is, uh, is currently stuck in the queue to depart Zurich Airport, I understand. We are hopeful that we'll be able to get him to at least connect um, online once he lands. Uh, we, but we're, we're looking at that and seeing how that works out with the time. So please bear with us on that one. And we do apologize, but I think you can understand with the current situation how difficult it is. So we move things around a little bit. The first thing we're going to do this afternoon then is our FFIs. Um, demonstration and presentation. Uh, we have uh, three gentlemen. First of all, uh, we have Donal, uh, and then we have Paul, and finally we have Thomas, uh, who are going to give us an overview of FFICE, uh, how it's operated uh, in reality, uh, and uh, uh, hints and tips to, to help you. Uh, we will do it three presentations in a row, and then we'll have a question and answer session. Should be about half an hour or so of, of presentations, and then we'll have the Q&A. Okay, so with that, over to you, Donald. Thanks, uh, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, FFI. So before I go any further, FFI, it's a pretty strange acronym. Can I just get a show of hands uh, from the room? from those of you that have some awareness of FFI, even if it's just uh, what, what these letters stand for. That's really interesting to see. Um, FFIs, it's a topic you're going to be hearing a, a lot more about in the coming months and uh, years. Uh, so FFIs, it's Flight and Flow Information for a Collaborative Environment. And my name is Donald Lawler. I'm the project manager of the Flight Plan and Flight Data Evolution project team here in uh, Network Manager, and we're working on the implementation of FFIs. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce the topic of FFIs to you. I'm going to be talking about the what, the why, and the when of FFIs, just to give you an overview of it. And then uh, Paul from Lufthansa and Thomas from Lufthansa Systems will speak about their experience in the implementation of FFIs. So firstly, what is FFIs? It's, um, it's a global concept from ICAO, and it defines the information requirements for flight plan, flow management and trajectory management for all phases of flight. Airspace users will be able to share much more uh, information, flight specific information, including 4D trajectory and flight specific uh, performance data, both uh, pre-departure and in flight. FFIS uses a, a standardized format called FIXM and this will enable uh, the uh, digitalization of flight information. For now, from the implementation point of view of FFIs, we're focused on pre-departure. And FFIs uh, will replace Flight Plan 2012 as the method of uh, flight planning. FFIs introduces the concept of the GUFI. The GUFI is the Global Unique uh, Flight Identifier. And uh, you know, for, for a flight, it may, be, it may be necessary to change a call sign. Uh, it may, there may be more than one call sign in the system for a daily flight, but there'll only ever be one uh, GUFI for each individual flight. And finally, FFIs is based on FFIs services, on the use of FFI services, and these services are provided in Europe by the network manager. So I want to give you a visual impression of the difference between 
uh, flight plan 2012 and an FFICE uh, flight plan. So you're probably all pretty familiar with the uh, uh, flight plan 2012. It has a number of uh, specific fields and to be fair it's quite limited in terms of its flexibility in, in extra information if you may want to share it. So we're moving from the environment of flight plan 2012 which enables human to machine interaction to the FFI's flight plan and this is just a short uh, excerpt of an FFI's flight plan. It's not intended to be read uh, by, by, uh, by the human. It's, um, it's a paradigm change uh, in terms of the amount of information that can be shared in the flight plan and moving to an environment that requires machine to machine uh, interaction. So why, why do we want to bring this in? So firstly, uh, uh, airspace users will be able to share much more information and flight specific information about their flights. And this will enable ATM service providers to better understand and meet the operational requirements of the airspace users. It will enable a much more enhanced collaboration between the airspace users, ANSPs and the network manager both pre-departure and in future in-flight, where trajectories will be able to be uh, shared and optimised in all phases of flight. It's scalable and flexible to be able to adapt to future needs that we may not even have uh, thought about yet. It's machine readable to be able to exchange vast amounts of information and it's an enabler for trajectory-based operations. So to move to the when, um, so it's an ICAO concept and in terms of implementation from an ICAO point of view, it's currently optional. Although ICAO has provided an indicative sunset date of flight plan 2012 of 2034. But crucially from a European point of view, uh, we don't have uh, this, this option. And we have a regulation uh, called uh, Commission Implementing Regulation 2021-116. It's otherwise known as the Common Project 1 or the CP1 regulation. And this regulation is intended to support the implementation of the European ATM Master Plan. This regulation requires the implementation of FFIs. And from the 31st of December 2025, this mandate uh, states that all IFR GAT airspace users operating within the FIRs, UIRs of the European Union um, 27 member states plus Norway and Switzerland will be required to um, exchange their flight plan information using FFIs. So this will require you from this date at the, at the latest to uh, change your use from, of flight plan 2012 to FFIs. The CP1 requirement for the implementation of FFIs also applies to ANSPs and to the network manager. And the network manager has implemented the FFIs services that are required by CP1 uh, for the uh, use of FFIs. Last year, the network manager and uh, the CSR deployment manager launched a common FFI support initiative to, and it's intended to enable and support the implementation of FFIs in accordance with the requirements of CP1. We would also recommend that you work closely with your flight plan service providers to uh, try to meet this mandate by this date. So finally, um, further information on the NM implementation of FFIs can be found in the NMIFBS user's manual. And you may also contact us uh, on this uh, FFI uh, Eurocontrol email address, and we'd be happy to help you with your, uh, with your questions. So this is just a start for, for FFI. We're gonna learn a lot and uh, improve it hopefully in the coming years, as more and more uh, people, uh, organizations start to implement FFI. And I'm delighted now to hand you over to uh, Paul from Lufthansa to speak about his experience of FFIs. Thank you. Yes, uh, 
Thank you, Donald. Um, now it's my task. So you've heard from Donald that there is that FFI's concept that it will change the flight plan format. And I want to point out in my uh, part of the presentation that it's not only a change of the flight plan format as such and only that, that it will also change your operation and the way you work with the flight plan. Because you've seen a first, um, yeah, first uh, or you got a first idea on how it looks like and you might have an idea already that it will significantly change how you work with the flight plan. You've seen a lot of uh, NMP uh, flight features in the today and yesterday. You've seen how you copy-paste flight plans, how you work with the Field 15, and all that will and needs to change in the future with the FFI's flight plan. So my presentation is about the changes and challenges. And uh, again, you've seen it from Donna already, um, just a quick idea how an FFI's flight plan can look like. Here you see an example of a Hamburg to Munich flight. And uh, on the right-hand side, you see the ICAO 2012 flight plan. You all know that, you know the items. And you see that there's a long scroll bar on the left-hand side, so it already shows that there's a lot of information in that EFPL, in that um, FFI's flight plan. And the question is, what kind of information is there? The basic answer is, it's everything which you have in the ICAO 2012 flight plan, plus more and plus more in particular is an better information on the trajectory, on the uh, planned flight trajectory. So let's have a deeper look into that. So what is um, maybe same, same, but different? So that's, for example, about the um, aircraft uh, type designator or some uh, equipment codes and stuff like that. You've had it in the uh, ICAO 2012 flight plan. You know where it is, and uh, you also have it in that structured format in the EFPL, which is an XML file, um, also can be found there. As Donny already said, this file is not intended to be read or created by a human being. It's intended to be created by a machine and to be read by a machine. You can represent and display all the information in any application which can read that file, but it's nothing where you would actually insert something. Of course, here you can think of, okay, maybe I just insert or add or delete um, some codes here. I can do that in any um, editor for where I can open the file. That might be easy. But um, looking into another example, which is very different, that's the actual trajectory information. And here I have an example of the very same flight, Hamburg to Munich. And you all know from the ICAO 2012 flight plan that we are struggling with really representing the descent and climb uh, profile. Um, we know, for example, in that particular case that there is a cruising altitude of flight level 390 and that we are somewhere uh, at some point crossing the waypoint Denix at some altitude, but we don't know whether it's already in flight level 390, whether we reach that flight level before or afterwards, and where we actually um, yeah, uh, get on our cruising altitude. On the left-hand side, you see the example of the very same flight uh, from an EFPL point of view. You see that we have an altitude information on the waypoint Denix. You might see it, it's very small, but we can have a deeper look into that in a second. You see that there is information on the altitude given in meters. Don't be worried about that. Of course, any application can transfer it to feet and, and convert it. Um, and we have not only that information about the waypoints, we also have the information on the actual top of climb, uh, you see it below, that there is an information given where that top of climb really is um, and uh, which altitude we reach there. So there is much better information on the vertical profile, on the trajectory, also with regards to timing. So we have uh, the information at which time we cross the certain waypoints much better than it is right now in the um, ICAO 2012 flight plan. So what I want to do now is I will uh, switch over to our live application um, of uh, Lido Flight, which is uh, like the latest version, which is available, because there we really started to go productive uh, more than a year ago in December 2022. We were the first ones filing EFPL basically in the world because it's only possible right now in Europe. And uh, we've been doing that now since then. Um, you will see that there's only few flights, not only because uh, there are cancelled flights today in Munich uh, due to the weather, but we did not really ramp up in the, in the last uh, months and weeks the amount of flights which we file as EFPL because of the challenges I want to point out um, later on. So um, we were together with uh, Lufthansa Systems and uh, the network manager in a um, CESA deployment project to uh, first of all test it uh, carefully 
um, that we get the acknowledged rates we want to achieve, and then went productive, as I said, more than a year ago. And, and here you can now see, um, first of all, I will switch to original format, how an EFPL would look like. And I can scroll uh, through here. So it's a flight from Copenhagen to Munich. Again, not a very long flight. I might zoom in a bit. Hope you can see it uh, very well on your screens. So it is an XML file and you see, okay, it can be just represented in the very original format, which does not really help you because if I ask you, okay, please read that file and tell me how the flight, where it will go along, you won't be able to answer that uh, within five seconds, I would uh, assume. So that's all the information in the original format. I can also maybe make it a bit bigger, but there is a way and, and Lido found a way together with uh, the use, um, with the designers to represent it in kind of a table format. So you see that there is the information represented in a structured way and you see things which you all know, for example, the cruising flight level, um, the call sign, for example, you also see information on the weight, which is also part of the um, trajectory. And here you can uh, see, uh, for example, equipment. And if you go further down here, it's going to be interesting because that's the uh, trajectory information. And I just explained to you, there is information, for example, on the top of climb. You always have the altitude. Again, here, give it a meter. So it, it's no magic just to convert it into feet if you want. And also about the relative time from departure. So you really have the information on the trajectory represented here in a table format. So uh, it's kind of an extended NAF log, I would say. And also information on the weight, as I just mentioned, so which is the gross weight. So network manager, as well as uh, any uh, ATC unit, could use that information for recalculating the trajectory in their system to improve and getting closer to what we think our flight would look like. Okay. What, uh, what are now the uh, benefits of uh, representing it? And uh, uh, by the way, one example here, the uh, Goofy, the uh, unique uh, flight identifier, which Donald mentioned, is given here. And as you see already, that's also not intended to be read by you, but rather by a machine, um, as you would not you know, call NM help desk and, and, and explain or talk <coughs> about the Goofy. So what you can do is, uh, this one, uh, you can, for example, um, yeah, just, uh, Compare flight plans, that's easy. So you see here for one example, flight level 390, and here we have flight level 380 uh, uh, in the beginning. So we can compare that and different weights and stuff like that. So um, that's possible with that kind of technical format to better uh, compare and, and figure out the difference. And you can, um, and also Lido here found a solution to display kind of a log. So what you also see, it's possible to do IFP UV check. It's also done in the new format then. If you file it in the new format, you also check for validity in that new format so that it can be really assured that it's gonna be acknowledged. And um, yeah, we, we found here a way to say, okay, there is, for example, a change. In EFPL wording, it's not actually a change, it's an EFPL update to be technical, uh, technically precise, um, but we just named it in the very same way, just not to confuse the users by, by different terminology. And again, if you click on here, you can see the original format, which we, prob which we need for some investigation if something goes wrong, but which is actually not intended to be read by a human being. And that, brings me actually to the challenges because now thinking about what we've seen in the last uh, or the yesterday and today, how you work with a flight plan right away tells you, okay, basically in two years when that regulation is in place, it's gonna be difficult to do the things you do right now in the very same way. One point before, we now find the full truth about the vertical profile and you uh, probably all know that there is challenges with the vertical profile right now with the item 15 and that you sometimes think, oh, if network manager would better understand what my trajectory is, it would be good because I would rather receive an acknowledge than a reject. But is that always the case? It can be the case, it can be good, it can have uh, the positive impact to receive an acknowledge instead of a reject, but it can be also vice versa. It can be that there is a reject instead of an acknowledge because you actually have an invalid flight plan in your system and it was just hidden in the item 15. And the very same applies to regulations. It might be that you get now into a regulated sector, which is not positive for you, but it might be that due to that better understanding of the tra trajectory, you're actually out of a regulated sector and avoid a slot. 
So it has both sides, and it's a very important information, I would say. Not everything is going to be better. It's just going to be more transparent and um, can be positive or negative out of uh, your point of view. And there is another thing about the vertical profile. We also receive an answer from network manager. So network manager still recalculates the vertical profile again in the, in the network manager system based on the data they have. Of course, with much more data we provide and we receive back and so-called agreed trajectory. Now the question is, who did agree to that trajectory? It's basically only one, that's the network manager. And now we receive that reply and the question could be, okay, what to do with that reply? Um, does it change anything in your operation? It's an open question. You might think about it. Thomas will uh, give an outlook after my presentation on what Lido plans to do with that. Um, but it's uh, something new which you can think of uh, how, to, how to use it. Right now in the, our Lido system, we're not really using it for any further consideration uh, regarding like an, a recalculation or something. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, Thomas will, will um, give an outlook on that later on. But now coming to the changes and the challenges, and I just put some examples uh, on that slide, and you've seen it uh, yesterday, today, uh, changes uh, in item 15, just quickly, um, just uh, an EUBT in the flight plan, change anything, quickly, manually filing it, copy-pasting it, is, and I would say, simply more or less impossible. Of course, as I said, there are things which you might change quickly. You can think about, okay, maybe changing an aircraft uh, registration could be done quickly via, an, via your flight planning application. But in particular, with regards to the trajectory, it means that filing a new trajectory always means that it has to be recalculated by your flight planning th system to consider that trajectory in an EFPL because you won't be able to manipulate the, f the flight plan, the EFPL, in a manual way. And that's, I think, the main message because that means you strongly have to collaborate with your flight planning uh, software provider uh, or with any other tool you use in your OCC. It might look very different to think about, okay, where do I use the ICAO 2012 flight plan? Where do I do changes manually? And how could that look in the future just having in mind the new format? And um, I would uh, think you have to start uh, thinking about that now and today because the regulation will come sooner than uh, later. So it's um, very important not to just leave it up to the flight planning service provider saying, okay, just implement a new format and everything is fine. Think about how it will affect you and your daily work. And there are more like kind of systematic challenges um, which are more related to the concept rather than to the daily operation. For example, we at some point will also file EFPL outside of Europe. Right now it's limited to network manager. Um, and then, for example, with the reply of the trajectory, we will receive several replies from all over the world for one uh, flight. So what do we do with that? How do we merge uh, those uh, things? So we have to gain experience in that and we have to be involved in the discussion. That's also one of my message. Uh, be involved in the discussions together with network manager and, and anyone out there if you are from the US and uh, with FAA and so on to talk about those topics because we need to find ways that we do not create more work in our OCCs but that it really helps to get a better understanding of our trajectory but not um, that it's up to us to merge all the different information in kind of a manual or technical way. Another point is, and uh, we had an uh, example of the taxi times um, yesterday, um, I think, um, the data consistency is very important. It does not really help if you file precise information where we are at each second, but then there's different taxi times in the systems, there's different information about terminal procedures, SIT and STARS, um, that will all like crash in a system if we just say, okay, we will be there at that departure route, but that departure route is simply not existing in the same way as it is in our flight planning system when it's different uh, in the network manager system. Well, now there are kind of technical workarounds to mitigate those uh, things, but it's not the idea actually to mitigate those things. We need uh, to work for better data consistency. And another point, and you've seen it in NMP flight, you can apply changes, you can do it uh, out of your flight planning system probably and so on. So you have several ways of working with the flight plan. Right now, EFPL, there's only one way, which is the web connection from our flight planning system to the network manager system. And if something there does not work, there is no second way right now, of course. Um, 
in two years, ICAO 2012 flight plan will be still there, and if something does not work, you can fall back, and uh, we do also have a fallback uh, use case in our application in Lido, um, but uh, it has to be also thought of how that could work later on, um, because uh, just to trust uh, one line of communication is probably not enough for your operation. So these are more questions than answers from my side, so because I just raised open question and it's up to you, I, I think that you consider the change and that you think about how to change your operation and the processes to be prepared for that only technical kind of format change which will lead to uh, the way you uh, create and update your flight plans. So that's all from my side, I think. Yes, it is. Um, and I will hand over to Thomas from Lufthansa Systems, who basically yeah, implemented the EFPL um, in the Lido flight system, and he will give an outlook on the uh, future, um, yeah, future in Lido. Ah, okay. So let's see. If I can. Ah, yeah. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I don't have much time. I think um, I will try to be not as fast that you cannot follow me. My name is Thomas Eschenhagen. I work for Lufthansa Systems in the department um, developing the flight planning solution um, Lido Flight used by a couple of you too. Um, um, I'm working in the domain of ATM. We are responsible for the, um, besides other things, creation of the flight plans um, and in this case the EFPL. Um, I want to talk a little bit about ideas we have, what we want to do with the EFPL in the future. Um, yeah. so, um, few technical aspects, some were mentioned already, but I wanted to put it together um, on one slide. Um, we have the ICAO 2012 flight plan as a text format. Um, the FFI flight plan as shown already, um, XML structure based on the FIXM standard format. Um, the ICAO flight plan will be transmitted via telex messages, via FTN or CETA net networks. Um, the EFPL will be transmitted via web services, which is a new internet technology, for instance, um, NMB2B um, web services. So it's also a complete different way of transmission. It's no possibility to send an um, EFPL via telex. No. Um, Flightman messages in the ICAO flight plan, you know them, FPL, change, delay, and cancel. The corresponding things in FFIs, um, web service requests, flight flight plan, flight plan update, and flight plan cancellation, um, and also similar for the replies. So the reply messages, acknowledge, reject, and manual um, correspond to replies concerning flight flight plan, flight plan update, and flight plan cancellation. <coughs> Um, and here you see them. Um, it's again also a small part. I didn't put the scroll bar. You can imagine it goes down. On the left hand side, the request um, XML structure is shown by Paul already. No wonder the reply looks, as, looks the same. It's also an XML structure. So what we get from Eurocontrol um, is in that deed not readable for many. I want to say not for many because I can read, but this is a different story. Uh, it's my business. So um, it's not intended for you to read it. Nevertheless, we, we present it. Um, Paul was also showing it already. Um, to have it at least available, but it's not possible to work on it really. Um, we will present the reply. Uh, our goal is to rep um, present reply in the same way as, he, as we present the um, the request in a time kind of, um, of table view. Um, you see here the request part. Um, the reply part will, the reply will look in the same, which allows also to compare uh, request and reply on this level, as already shown by, by, by Paul, um, with different flight, flight, flight plans. In addition, we will display request and, request and reply um, in graphical form, um, here for two flights on the left, one flight on the right hand flight on top, the horizontal profile and on bottom the uh, horizontal route, sorry, and on bottom the vertical profile. Um, 
This is another example, this is one flight on top um, on from left to right, the complete trajectory, the departure procedure part and the arrival procedure part, and on bottom you see the corresponding vertical profile for the complete flight for the departure procedure and arrival procedure part. For sure we will not show it in this Excel style stuff, we will show it um, in the same way as we do it in, in Lido flight for the fight flight plan, um, um, the route on, on, on the map and the vertical profile. So in the future here, um, we will show both the fight flight plan as, as well um, as um, the reply. What's next? Um, next step after displaying the reply is the analysis of the reply. Um, it was mentioned already, NM uses the file trajectory, the, um, the trajectory in the um, request, and calculates its own NM calculated trajectory, which considers additional constraints. For instance, the, the well-known profile tuning restrictions and other constraints. Um, this has an impact mainly to the, for the trajectory. Um, so. Um, put here the terms already again. So in the request we have the file trajectory, in the reply we have the agree trajectory, in both cases the 4D trajectory, um, and the agree trajectory can differ from the file trajectory. The main parts that differ are the procedure parts um, and um, the cruise levels because of the application of additional constraints, which result in different trip distance and different trip time in the end, different this is not this is, um, obvious. Um, the challenge out of, is, out of it is how we are able to identify how far, how, does, uh, how, how much the trajectory in the reply differs from the um, trajectory in the request. It's a 4D trajectory, so with three dimensions and time. And so you can imagine to quantify somehow how, how, how much is the difference. Because um, if both trajectories differs much, then it might be required that the dispatcher has a look on it and says, I need to do something. But if the trajectories are almost the same, they will probably never be exactly the same, which would be nice, but I don't expect other thing. Um, so if, uh, if they are almost the same, then the dispatcher does not need to do anything because they're quite, uh, quite the same. So, more, okay. Um, what are significant differences? Um, here I have one point of, um, of a trajectory on the left-hand side in the request and on the right-hand side in the reply. You see already the amount of text is different. But if you have a closer look, then we see the designator is the same, so we assume it is the same point. And in yellow, I highlighted the differences. Um, the along route distance, so the trip distance is, is different. The altitude is different. The trip, trip time is different. Even the coordinates are different. How does it happen that in our system, we have different coordinates for the same point than Eurocontrol? we can think about and talk about and discuss, but the interesting question or the challenge is to um, determine um, the, 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 or to quantify the, the difference and see is this difference accept in an acceptable threshold, whatever it is, it's not yet defined, or is it too, are these points too far away um, from each other to, to say, okay, they represent a significant change that somebody needs to have a look on it. For instance, if the altitude difference is too much, then, it, then there's a different vertical profile, which needs to be analyzed by the dispatcher. So analysis is an important thing. Other, point, other thing is um, the reply contains, contains additional points. Are these points... Um, acceptable because they are how to say, on the path of the um, 
um, request a trajectory or if they are far away. So do they represent root changes or significant vertical changes? So how it's possible to identify if, um, if an additional point in the reply um, um, represents a significant difference? I don't have an answer yet, but it's a challenge we have to, uh, we are faced and we have to find a solution for it. Um, after the analysis, the next step is what we at least have in mind is um, what can we do with um, the reply that we get. And one aspect is that we want to use um, um, elements of the reply to recalculate on this base um, the trajectory um, to have also the possibility to um, evaluate the reply with regard to the constraint information and the weather information that we have in our system. And the main elements um, are here highlighted in blue for um, two points um, are um, additional constraints that are provided in the reply um, that can be used to be considered in subsequent um, trajectory calculations. Ah, the last slide, and then, then I'm done. Um, far in the future, um, we would like to elaborate the concept of the FFI's, flight, uh, FFI's planning service. Um, the FFI's planning service is an interesting concept from, at least from my point of view, because it, how to say, has, has advantages, okay. The idea is that um, first flight calculations start already 24 or even 36 hours before EOBT, and that the first calculation considers as less as possible constraints. Um, NM will answer with a reply that might contain additional pro uh, constraints. And these additional constraints can then be used for next flight calculations, with, which gives some, such an iteration which ends up in a point when the reply contains the same constraints as used in the, in, in the request. So when the agree trajectory, it's not yet, so the uh, trajectory in the, in the reply contains the same constraints as used for the, for the file tra trajectory. This would be the first iteration. And then NM has a concept of periodic re-evaluations of the provided trajectory um, over the time when additional, when, when changes come in the system um, the trajectory we re-evaluated and could result in um, additional need for, for uh, the need for consideration of additional constraints which would be pro pro provided to us can be again used um, in, in um, additional flight calculations. Um, the goals for this concept is uh, um, that NM gets an early information about the traffic demand, which could allow um, to activate only necessary constraints and not all constraints that, that are published. So one concept that is in this, could be used in this relation is dynamic rut um, concept, um, so that only necessary constraints um, need to be activated. In the end, flights could become less restricted. It's, it's a lead, at least a hope. And uh, for the airlines, it could result in the fact that the file trajectory can become the agreed trajectory without additional changes, which moves uh, the, how to say, constraint negotiation in the earlier phase of the planning and, and the constraint situation becomes more stable, um, closer to the EUBT. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. <laughs> thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Donal. Um, quite a wide-ranging subject, quite a complex subject. Um, so, just to um, so we were introduced to the future of FFIs. Uh, Donald explained to us what FFIs is. Introduced the subject of the. Uh, I'm going to ask a question myself here. Goofy or Guffy? I'm not sure. I would say Goofy, but I don't know. But um, yeah. 
Uh, we'll take your votes on it later. And um, so we introduced that, looked at some of the difference between 2012 flight plan and, uh, and the future FFI's flight plans um, and the mandate for it, although there isn't a mandate at the moment, we are implementing it in Europe. Um, Paul then went, talked about some of the details about how it's not to be read by humans um, uh, and the in, some of the enhanced information that is uh, available uh, in, uh, in the uh, new flight planning and that of course uh, mainly is uh, related to the trajectory. Uh, we, uh, we touched on the subject of the acknowledged regret, uh, reject, regret, reject conundrum and the transparency there uh, and the idea of an agreed trajectory and who actually is agreeing that. There were some of the challenges mentioned and I think particularly some of the people in this room as the outside of Europe and the multiple stakeholders so that may come up in some questions and some data consistency issues. Then our colleague uh, Thomas from uh, representing Lido talked uh, about the future of EFPL, uh, how it will be B2B, uh, how, how to display the replies, how to analyse the replies and the challenges there, um, particularly with the significant differences and what is a significant difference. And then finally some stuff on the far future of the planning service. So quite a lot covered there. Uh, the gentlemen are in the room, they're happy to answer any questions. We have a little bit of time here. Um, so, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to uh, ask the gentleman on this subject? Oh. At the back there, sir. Hello, Nicola from Aletaro. Um, I have a question regarding uh, other flight uh, planning uh, systems. Will it be, uh, will they need to have uh, also integrated uh, FFIs or uh, it, it will be only available in Lido? So your question is if everyone has to implement it by given the mandate or? I mean, uh, the, the, the flight planning systems will have to integrate, right? Yeah. In the, um, to lose the 2012 uh, ICAO flight plan, right? <laughs> and that's the, that's the plan to, to, to go until. That's uh, then the question to your to flight, flight planning to service to provider, what the plan uh, is like. Uh, we worked together with Lido because we knew that's coming, but uh, by the end of the day, everyone has to implement it. And as I said, I think it's not only about just implementing the uh, format as such, because there is, you know, documentation on that and you could do that, but also how the user will interact with it. So there's actually more change in the flight planning system, I would foresee, than just implementing only the, for the format how to file it. No, no, nothing else uh, to add to that, but uh, yeah, from, from the, the, the date given in the mandate, all use of flight plan 2012 will have to be replaced by the FFI's flight plan for all flights within the EU area plus Norway and Switzerland. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. So, okay, we, thank we you can, for that. So, we, do you have a... Yeah, we can, we can t really t talk a lot, a lot about it, and maybe it's a re real important thing. So, from theoretically, end of... 2025, um, for all flights departing in Europe, arriving in Europe or overflying Europe, an EFPL has to be sent. Point. Um, in addition, you might be aware that if you start outside Europe and overfly only Europe, in addition, an ICAO flight plan has to be sent to the other ANSPs. So, in fact, for each flight, two flight plans have to be sent an ICAO flight plan as well as an EFPL, which increases the challenge for the flight planning system to do so. Um, yeah. And um, again, each flight it has, to be has to be realized in each flight planning system. Yeah. I don't know which one you use, I don't want to know. So, yeah. Um, um, and as you can see, um, Lido Flight is able to do so, Lufthansa is using it, so at least all uh, uh, um, users of the Lido flight um, um, application have already the possibility to do it today um, yeah, with the corresponding system. But it's really important, it must be done. And, um, sorry, um, maybe you noticed that we, that we did not, that, that NMP flight did not appear here. Um, so, um, sorry, sorry guys. No NMP flight in this presentation. 
And as Paul already mentioned, uh, with LNP flight, you cannot do it. Simply, you cannot put an EFPL in LNP flight and file it. Yeah, so nothing that, in, in fact, really nothing that is available in NLP flight today. And um, sorry, Martin, NLP flight is not the future. But <laughs> yeah, so the, the future will be a tool that supports an EFPL. It must be. And somebody could, I don't know, Andy maybe says when this tool will be available. I don't know. Sorry, I'm done. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, NMP flight is the future, by the way. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a, there's a couple of questions. Uh, gentleman from Luxair. Yes, hi, it's Mohamed from Luxair. So as you mentioned, the flight plan, the EFPL, will not be uh, possible to send it via uh, CETA or AFTN. By now, uh, for the uh, destination outside of Europe, where we are coming back to Europe, we have to send some flight plans uh, using AFTN. Uh, does this system will be exist later? As you said just right now, we will have to send again a flight plan and ICAO format for the outstation. So um, we'll be ending using two systems actually. Um, that's part of my question and it will be a huge work for us, I think. But the other part is a um, Flight planning service provider, are they aware about that? They will provide anything for us because we are the end user actually. And um, just to have an idea if it is announced and known for the providers or not. Um, the first question I can answer, yes. Um, the flight planning system um, will for such cases, each flight planning system will for such cases um, we have, the, um, we have have to have the possibility to send an ICAO flight plan via FTN or Zeta, as well as an EFPL via B2B services. So both need to be supported um, for a longer period of time, at least until 2034, the sunset date of, of ICAO, which might be. So, um, with, other, with regard to the other flight planning um, system providers, I cannot really tell exactly if all are aware of it. It would be good if all airlines approach their provider and ask them and challenge, challenge them. I know that a couple of other um, uh, companies are already working on it. Yeah? So at least the major ones are, are aware of it and are already working on it. Uh, thanks. Uh, any other comments? Uh, our, our gentleman from Turkey, please. From Sanek, please. And uh, can Lido support both uh, ICO uh, um, 2012 and also the EFPL in the same time in for the each flight? Yeah, so right now it's not realized, but um, uh, basically Thomas mentioned it already. I think it, it, it needs to be implemented because otherwise it won't be possible to fly outside of Europe, you know, to leave Europe or to enter Europe. Um, and at least Lufthansa still wants to do those flights, so uh, that's why yeah. we thank need you. to have it implemented, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Over there. Jet Story Poland. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so uh, the uh, new format it is designed to be uh, done uh, only uh, from the point of uh, flight planning tool, not manually. And I'm, uh, I have uh, a question to, to NM operator. So what about uh, tools for validation in NOP, NMP? Because they will be useless because we have to got some, some kind of validation tool uh, built up in, uh, in a flight planning tool, right? Um, it has been mentioned already, um, similar to the, to the today flight plan validation feature that is available in NLP flight for the ICAO flight plan, um, the same exists for the EFPL. So there's a trial um, service um, that can be, that corresponds to the flight plan validation and has the same feature. Um, so the, the functionality exists. Um, it must be only, um, there must be only a system where you can 
use this service to validate this flight plan. Yeah, and in Lido, we do it. So you can press on a button and then it will be validated, the EFPL. Does it answer your question? Okay, uh, any other questions in the room at the moment? I believe we have a couple online, but uh, uh, gentleman at the back there, sir. Hi, uh, I'm Yanai from Japan Airlines. Uh, thank you for your great presentations. Uh, Europe is, uh, I think Europe is the most advanced uh, region in the world uh, for the FFIs, uh, but uh, probably um, <coughs> um, when FFIs it started in Europe, uh, many other uh, regions, including Japan, uh, cannot support uh, the FFIs. So my question is, uh, for example, uh, for the flight from uh, Europe to Japan, uh, should, should we wait to use EFPL uh, until all other regions was uh, passed through support FFIs? Um, or do we just send the EFPL to your control? Uh, and uh, your control will uh, send the uh, old format to any other regions? This is my question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, yes, theoretically, from the 1st of January in 2026, you have to file EFPL to Europe, to Euro control. And there is no exception. So it also affects your flight from Tokyo to somewhere into Europe. So that's the, the main point. And how you solve that problem that you have to file basically two flight plans, one ICAO flight plan to the rest of the world and the EFPL to Europe, is basically up to you or your, to your flight planning tool. It could be that you just file those things in parallel. It could be that you use uh, um, uh, features uh, given by Eurocontrol to, to readdress flight plans because Eurocontrol offers the service to translate an EFPL to ICAO 2012 flight plans. So it will translate uh, the trajectory into an item 15 and so on. And um, you also receive that reply back. So you could use that uh, flight plan as well. So there is ways, but uh, you have to find out a way. And basically there is no final answer on that. Even we as, as users of EFPL, and we only use it within Europe right now, um, we don't have the, the clear way how to solve that problem, how to, how to tackle that, how that will be transparent to the user, how the, uh, um, so the software will um, solve that issue. But basically, there has to be a solution within the next two years, um, given that mandate. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much. That answers your question. Thank you, sir. Um, Augustin, did you want to make any comment? <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, yes. Uh, regarding the, the question from Japan Airlines, I think it was, uh, we, do have an, uh, we do have a feature implemented in, uh, in our system, which is equivalent. Oh, sorry, I've been running. Um, we ha which is equivalent to today's uh, readdressing function. Uh, so we, we can accept an, an uh, EFPL. And uh, in FFS, it's called uh, translation and delivery. So uh, in an EFPL, one can indicate an AFT and address to which we can translate and deliver that uh, flap in 2012. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sure Augustine will be able to follow up with you, sir, if you, if you want to get some more information uh, as uh, he's one of our experts here in Eurocontrol. Thank you very much, Augustine, for coming down. And I'm sorry I got a bit out of puff there. It is it's surprising how many steps there are between there and here. Um, gentlemen uh, at the back there, please, if you had a question. Yeah, actually, my question was uh, concerning uh, something like interface uh, from the Eurocontrol system to other system worldwide. But I think my uh, question is now uh, almost answered by the gentleman. Um, because uh, not all of us are using Lido, and um, the EFPL flight plan looks really good, but uh, I don't know, it's, it sounds like an obligation for airlines to find a solution uh, starting from uh, yeah 1st of January 26 to find a solution with the provider. 
But if there is something like that, as you mentioned, um, the gentleman mentioned now, for interfacing, just to, we are the Europe European user within the flight plan as usual, and Euro control in cooperation with other, um, let's say, FAA or something, uh, can transmit the flight plan outside Europe. That will be easier for everyone, I think. Augustin? I think you should, uh, you should not forget that your first obligation is to, to respect whatever the local uh, regulation is. So if the local regulation obliges, obliges you to, uh, to submit a flight plan through the local ARO, then what's, that's what you, you have to do. And of course for Europe you, you will have to submit an EFPL. But that, that uh, obligation needs to be fulfilled, of course. So it's correct, I agree with you, but uh, as I said the example before, uh, our flights which departing from Europe to Africa, let's say, to Egypt, um, we send the flight plan, by the way, back from Egypt to Europe. You have to send the flight plan via EFTN or, at worst case, uh, via CETA. Otherwise, the local authorities in Egypt, they will not accept the flight plan. Thank you. Point well noted. Um, and thank you for Augustin again for making himself available for two questions. That was good. Thank you. A word check from Lot, please. Yeah, yeah. Going back to, to my uh, Jetstar colleague question uh, regarding validation of the flight plan. Uh, if I understood your presentation correctly, it will not work the same way because we can file to validation system the our EFPL proposition and we will receive the accepted trajectory which doesn't have to be the same we have filed. So as long as the, the validation system won't show the dispatcher the differences, uh, it is worth nothing because what then the dispatcher should do preparing the flight plan? Check each of these 200 and something lines to to notice the, the difference. But sometimes I, I believe there, there, there can be only the difference in, in, the, in the profile, but in exceptional cases, it can be, for example, difference with uh, uh, in an uh, oceanic exit point. No. So we will send the IKEA flight plan 2012 to, to, to Iceland or, or Greenland uh, with some some exit point, oh, I put too far. Okay, uh, but uh, and they will have the other entry point than our exit point um, in Europe. So first of all, with regards to the the validation, it works the same way. In, in given that you either re uh, receive a reply, which means that what you would file is acceptable or not. So that's kind of the same information that it would always mean if you file that particular EFPL, you, it would be accepted or not. So that's the main message of that, that reply. Um, with regards to the differences in the trajectory, the issue could happen actually right now already. So the, and uh, maybe Augustine can uh, elaborate on that. So there is, there is again a calculation of the trajectory in the NM system and it could lead to not kind of any trajectory, but it can have differences. It can have differences today, and it can have differences in the future. The difference uh, to today's workflow is that you are more aware in the reply what the difference in the NM system is, and that you might use it uh, in your flight planning system. But again, if there is a difference uh, between the request and the reply trajectory, um, but the uh, the validation check will tell you it's acceptable, you can still file the flight plan and it would be accepted. And I think it does not go that far that you have different oceanic uh, entry and exit points. So. <laughs> no, probably, probably what should be um, explained, that that's already a detail regarding the, the content of an EFPL. So the EFPL contains a, a group which is called root trajectory group, right? And effectively what it, what it is, you have, you have inside of this, you have the item 15, so the route, you have the expanded route, and you have then further uh, details regarding the trajectory. So how you, you should look at this is like you're looking at the Google Maps, right? When you have an out view, you, you see the highways, you zoom in, you start seeing the, the boulevards, you zoom in even further, you start to see the small routes, or roads, sorry. 
and the small roads are what, what the details provided by the trajectory are. So uh, in such a, a, a big discrepancy between an entry point or exit point from the oceanic that, uh, that should not uh, result in, a, um, in, an, uh, in this kind of exchange. So basically we're not modifying the part of item 15 of the, of the route in our agreed trajectory. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that and thank both of you for, for your answers. Um, gentleman from Ekoska, you still have a question? Hi, Daniel from Ekoska. Um, my question is, uh, which kind of feedback did you get from the dispatchers in the ops room uh, out of your experience? Because it has been one year. And does it generate a higher uh, workload uh, for the guys over there? Yes, it does. So that's the, and that's the main message actually on the, on the challenges. It, right now, just implementing the new flight plan format creates more workload because when you want to make use of NMP flight or any other tool, if you want to copy paste, you have to convert it back to ICAO 2012. And right now it's easy, we can always fall back. Um, uh, there is a button, I could have shown it in the application, so we can switch back to ICAO 2012, the dispatcher can do so, but that's of course then more clicks, more work right now. And the message is, and, and we need to work together with Lido on that challenge as well, and everyone has to work on that challenge, how the flight planning system will support all the use cases you have right now in such a way that it does not end up in more workload. So we implemented it right now for the sake of testing it technically, um, uh, getting the feedback, but uh, we need to have improvements in Lido to really work with the flight plan that we can roll it out in a um, on all the flights. So that's, um, that's the way it is, and I think it will affect everyone uh, independent of the flight planning tool you use. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's uh, one question here. Hi, Anurag from Air India. I just had a question, like with the AFP to, uh, AF, uh, FPL 2012, we have the option of getting a proposed route in case my route is not acceptable. What will be the process in case of this uh, FFIs? There does not exist a corresponding service for EFPL. So route proposals can be retrieved only on the base of ICAO flight plans. And the only way to do is what Paul also already mentioned, um, to, to convert or to create an ICAO flight plan um, out of the EFPL and put it into the um, routing assistance um, service. Um, it would be a question rather to, uh, to NM um, if and when and how um, other services can be um, used um, natively on the base of EFPL. <laughs> if, if I may, uh, Thomas, I think, sorry for that, but I, I think in the, uh, in the response to a trial request, uh, we can return a, uh, what, what it is today, an equivalent of a, of a proposed route in the form of a negotiating trajectory. That's what it is. Now, you you will have to you have to assess it and analyze it whether it's convenient for it's you. Not of the course. same as the routing um, assistance service. Right. No, it's not exactly the same. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Andy, and then we've got one more question here, and then I think we need to start thinking about wrapping this up. Having said that, I can see at least three more questions here. Um, so, Andy first. Thanks. I, I just want to <coughs> to to explain NM systems. Don't, the, the, the route proposal is a trajectory, full 4D trajectory. Many of them, depends how far we search. The representation on NMP flight or the NOP or the CHMI is an ICAO route, field 15. There's nothing to prevent us in the next version of NMP flight before the deadline to represent our internal trajectory in another way. So there's no reason to be concerned that suddenly NM route proposals function is going to suddenly disappear. It'll just be potentially looking a bit different. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification. I appreciate that. So. Thank you. Uh, question to Paul. Paul, uh, this uh, new format E flight plan, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we are using in the, the on, on board is EFP. Uh, with the RNC 633-2 format. Uh, will there be any differences with this uh, for the uh, EFP usage of this uh, flight plan format? 
I didn't get the, I didn't really get the question, I think, but you yeah. have the answer. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the, it doesn't have any impact to the um, RX6 sushi format um, sent to, to the EFB um, because um, you must you must see that that both have the same source. So in the end, the source for everything mm. um, is a result of the calculation, and the calculation result, which is in case of Lido megabytes of information um, is uh, then translated into a KO flight plan, translated into an EFPL, and translated in, into Ring 633 format. So uh, the EFPL does not have any impact to, to, um, to the transmission of um, flight plan information um, to the EFP. Okay? Now I also got a question given that answer <laughs> and uh, the, the only point you might uh, think about is the representation of the ATC flight plan in the briefing package. So uh, you also have, you know, ATC FPL and just basically what you file, you also uh, bring it to your briefing package. And now the question is if there is, you know, very far in the future, no ICAO 2012 flight plan at all, there is actually no reason to bring that into a briefing package because it's right now, you know, somehow displayed to to have consistency between ATC and um, and uh, and the crew. But by the end of the day, if you have the enough log and the whole briefing package, and if you file the whole trajectory with the same data, um, the enough log as such in the briefing is actually what you also send to ATC. So um, that's uh, that's something you might think about how to how to transfer that information to the crew or if still needed to, to um, have a dedicated section for the ATC FPL. Okay, thank you. Uh, I noticed there's a, there are a few more questions, so I'll try and address a few of those. Our colleague from uh, Swiss has landed, the Eagle has landed, um, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to get a connection there. Uh, the gentleman on the end there, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's already mentioned during, maybe I missed, but I just would like to ask a general question. Yeah, I know uh, we are, and you also would like to do uh, a better use of European uh, skies, uh, but has this been coordinated with the other regions? Are they able to implement it, or is it going to be a mandate for the Asia, Africa? Do they have the technology to be able to answer this? Uh, it's a general question, but I just want to know if it's going to be translated for another 20 years from ICAO to uh, what is the benefit of that? So I just would want to ask that. As I, I think uh, for a general question, I'll try to provide a general answer. But as, uh, as, as Donald uh, indicated, this is an ICAO concept. It's been developed by ICAO, uh, fully detailed by uh, at ICAO level. So all the regions were uh, involved that are aware of. Uh, the only difference between this development in terms of ICAO and the Flapley 2012 is that there is no precise imposed cutoff date at the global level. So they said it's on a need basis, on a region by region, as they wish to, to implement it. Basically, that, that's what it is. Uh, are they capable? I know that there are plans uh, in, in, in U.S. region. I know there are plans in Japan in Asian regions as well. There are many countries from Asia which are very, very much uh, active in, in FFI's uh, uh, arena, I would say. So uh, when it comes to when exactly are they going to implement it, I think we're looking at uh, 2029 probably or maybe a couple of years later. I don't know the exact uh, years here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Donald, you're going to respond there? Yeah, we have, a, um, we have a working group here in Eurocontrol called the Flight Plan and Flight Data Evolution um, uh, subgroup, and we're working on the implementation of FFIs. Uh, the FFA have, have joined as a member since the last uh, meeting, and there is ongoing uh, coordination uh, between CSAR Deployment Manager and the FF, FAA. I think they're going to learn from what we're doing here in Europe. At uh, the, uh, the last meeting, they gave the indication that they wouldn't have uh, a mandate uh, for FFIs. Thank you very much for your answers. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to know about, for example, my our colleague just mentioned in Egypt, they, they people are still going with the paper IKEA format there to tower to file the flight plan. And I just wanted to know if it's going to be applicable and everyone will be benefiting from this or is it just for the European 
Thank you very much for the answers. Okay, thank you. Um, I want us to make sure that we finish on time today um, because I know you will have flights to catch and all the rest of it. So um, we're still looking at about a 16.30 at latest for us to finish today. I want to take a couple more questions here. Our, our, our colleague from Swiss has landed and um, hopefully he'll be able to connect. That's not guaranteed, of course, and we'll have to work out how that's going to happen. But I'll take a couple more subject questions on this. A couple more questions on this subject, then I'm going to go to the ones uh, for, the, for the question and answer session, some of the more generic ones, gen general ones. You still have the opportunity on this subject, if I don't address it now, to please put it in the QR code. It will get addressed because we'll pass it on to Augustine, we'll pass it on to Peter, uh, to Paul uh, and Thomas, etc. Gentlemen from Sun Express, you get the last question on this subject, sir. Can we just yeah. have a, just let uh, the question be asked, please, thanks. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, there will be uh, some uh, positive and negative impacts of usage the uh, FFI, uh, FFIs. Uh, so uh, you are uh, ex experiencing this uh, on your uh, operation, uh, partly. Uh, did you analyze uh, what's the impact of, uh, I mean, based on the uh, rejection and the acknowledged uh, cases? What uh, is the positive impact is higher or uh, less than the negative? That's I expected that I question to be the first question, actually. Yeah, I was surprised. Um, uh, we, like when, when we started, or basically Thomas started to test a, like kind of a prototype on the test environment, um, started very, at a very low level of acknowledge rate. I don't know, you know, he started with whatever the number was. And it was then increased by changing, uh, changing the implementation. And uh, we, as a prerequisite before implementing that, of course, wanted to have a kind of a 90 whatsoever percent, uh, percentage of acknowledge rate and um, that it's comparable to IKO 2012. So we didn't want to get worse. And then it's a case by case thing to, to really look at uh, flights where we might have a recheck right now with uh, the EFPL. And there are cases where we, when we switch back to IKO 2012, are valid and we have the other way around. So that's a case by case um, assessment. Um, but the acknowledge rate uh, on average is uh, at least the same. So that was our prerequisite before uh, getting it implemented. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much and thank you, gentlemen. That was uh, quite a lot of questions there, quite a lot of detail, much appreciated. Uh, okay, we're going to try and uh, we're going to rejig the, sh the schedule a little bit. Andy is out at the moment. Uh, apparently, um, uh, Simon is in a taxi on his way over. This is really exciting. It's, uh, it's like a movie. Um, I'm not sure whether it's a comedy or a tragedy, but we're going to find out so soon enough. So what I thought we would do now is we'll move forward the general questions, the questions that you've been putting through on the QR codes over the period of the two days. Um, I've got a piece of paper here with quite a few of them. Some of them are already been answered. Um, what I'll do, I've got a couple here that I did a bit of research this morning and got some answers for you. So I'm going to address those personally and then I'll hand over and get Chris will we'll put a few in. What um, we have our experts on the back row there looking all... Uh, Looking like a mugshot there. It looks like the usual suspects on the back row. Um, so all of our, um, uh, our flow expertise, we have the flight planning expertise in the room. We have our customer services team in the back there as well. We have some people ha pretending to hide in the translator's booths, but uh, you can't hide there. If there's a question, I'll be calling you down. So, uh, Okay, so we have the expertise. So we'll go through some of the written questions. If there is uh, anything else that you want to ask on any of the subjects that have been presented here today, feel free, either by the QR code or by hand. Um, we will perhaps interrupt this when, uh, when and if Simon arrives. If there's a question that you've asked that doesn't get answered, as I said to you before, and I'll keep saying, we will record it, we will look at it, we will get back to you after the event. So please put the name of your organization on any QR question so that we can do that. Okay, so I hope that's clear. There was a couple of questions here uh, that, uh, that came in yesterday, one of, one, one of which was, when replacing CHMI not with one system, how do you plan to limit impact on operations, on ops, during maintenance crisis or crisis resilience when there's a system outage? So I think that question, what that's really, the way I've understood that question, and, and if I have understood it incorrectly, please tell me, is that we're replacing two systems with one. 
that's actually not the case because the CHMI and the NOP both went through what we call the CUA, which is one of our uh, our platform in the background. So in so actually, um, it, it's still we're going from one to one. That's the first part of it. The second part of it is the new platform is a digital platform and it's in the cloud. So actually, we have much more resilience in the future because if we do have any problems, we can switch from a cloud there to a cloud there to a cloud there. So that's all being planned in our new system. Please don't ask me too many more in questions on this because I'm not an expert in, uh, in clouds and all the rest of it, but um, that's what I was told today. So we are planning extra resilience uh, because of uh, with the extra redundancy by being able to switch um, from uh, one virtual area to another one. Um, second question uh, that I can answer at least was, where can you find all the AIPs for free in one area? Hmm, okay. All AIPs for free. Um, okay, let's be. Let's, so EAD is, is the place to go for that. Um, all the European EM, AIPs are there, plus uh, some of the extra ones that are members of EAD. Uh, in terms of um, the rest of the world, we don't have everything there, but the PAM system there has uh, has that's where the that's the best place, the best storage for them. Is it free? Uh, largely, um, there may be some licensing fees depending on how you connect. If it's B two B, there's no charge. If it's B two C, there may be some licensing charges. The best thing to do is go to the website if you haven't done that already, uh, and uh, they will be able to help you. And of course, if there are any difficulties, uh, we'll follow through for you as well. I hope that is clear and I hope that uh, that helps. Um, so Chris, are there any other questions uh, at the moment that we can uh, address? Yeah, um, many airlines don't have their own ATF own address and it happens regularly when help is asked of NMOC that they can only send results via AFTN. Is there another way of doing this? Can somebody uh, answer that for me? Andy, can you help? So many airlines don't have their own AFTN address. It happens regularly when help is asked to NMOC that they can only send the result by AFTN. Is there any other way of doing it? That rather depends on, uh, we have B2B, we have, uh, it rather depends on that. And I think we may need a bit more clarification on that. Andy, can you help? I, I don't quite understand the question because our IF, our flight planning staff um, regularly answer email requests for help. Um, so I'm not, I, it sounds more like a system to system issue. I know that we've asked before for operational reply messages like the ACK and the reject to be sent to SMS and emails, but at the moment the only option is, is to send them via B2B web services or AFTN CETA, but um, we'd need more clarification on the question, I think. If, if the person that asked that question wants to clarify, you said? Yeah, so basically I've asked this question because it's happened regularly that me or my team ask the uh, hotline to provide support on a flight plan, and the answer we get is that they can only upload their results by AFTN, and when we ask them if they can provide an email with the new routing, they say they can't, or, and sometimes it's really difficult to get the, that result, so. Uh, Mark Collis, are you here? It's up in the translator booth there. Hello, Mark. Yeah, you may have to come down. <laughs> I shall give Mark the uh, microphone. Okay, I understand the question. So sometimes we ask you to, we do reply via AFTN or CETA, correct? <coughs> this has to do with our systems. They are a bit separated from, from the email address we are using. So <coughs> we prefer to send it via CETA or AFTN to keep our systems separately. Because email, we have to, to send a flight plan the request, we have to send it to the other computer, and then we can send it to you. So that's one of the reasons why we only we only do this in AFTN or CETA, but we can do it via email as well. 
but we try to keep it separate, as I said, because of the safety of the systems. So, and as well, most of the airlines do have safety at Orsita. So, meaning that we sending this to the right person as well. So, not to Gmail addresses or or all the other kind of email addresses. Okay. Thank you. I, I hope that's clear. Is there any follow-up on that? Okay, good. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, just uh, looking at the uh, um, sheet of questions here, I found one that I can answer. I'm not sure I can answer it correctly, um, but I will attempt it, and then obviously one of my more expert colleagues can uh, uh, can uh, can help me out if I get it wrong. Or are critical flights the same as filing ATFMX? The answer to that is, as far as I'm aware, no. One of them is, thanks, <laughs> ATFM exempt approved is the ATFMX, which is only for very specific flights, which are very clearly um, delineated in our book um, and in our manuals. The um, critical flights were explained yesterday. That's the 5% um, with uh, um, uh, maximum of 20 per day, um, regulated per day. So I think that, so that's the difference. I'm going to hand over. So the gentlemen, they're nodding, ladies, gentlemen. Um, have I got that correct, Nicola, Nivena? Oh, look at that, good, excellent, thank you. So that, that's uh, that's the difference there. Um, there was also a suggestion here about can you set up different rights for different tokens? Just read for pilots, critical marking for supervisors only, etc. Now we've discussed tokens before uh, in the, in the uh, last couple of days, the beginning. Uh, yes, there are issues. We are looking at it for our new system access rights and such like. Our customer service people are well aware of that. So it is a suggestion that we'll take on board. And if there are any further suggestions for how you would like to ask, access our system. Uh, in the future, then we will uh, try and take those on board. So please, uh, please do make those suggestions. Chris. Yep. Um, an interesting one here, which I think has been banded around recently. What is the policy for a flight with a last validation limit who got a CTOP after that time? Should the route be changed? Simon? If you get a CTOP, the system will make sure that you will not enter the flight plan restriction. It will actually give you a CTOT to arrive before the closure of that system, of that uh, restriction. So you're actually favored in, uh, compared to all the other flights in uh, the regulation. However, there are periods when we have significant numbers of these flights where we may have yeah. to do some coordination. I don't know if you have heard the term before, but these are the so-called V flights. They are indicated in our slot list with a V, and they can create an overload situation for the ATCs. So there are different ways of handling this. And one of the last reason, last resorts we have in this case is to suspend your flight. So there might be a suspension because of a restriction, and then we are asking you to refile and to, uh, to stay out of that restriction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, and that sort of disruption, we're talking um, uh, normally large-scale military exercises, but, but uh, more commonly these days uh, when there's uh, industrial action is one of the more common times that we might, uh, might find that. So it, it is a difficult situation, but we do uh, do our best to, to resolve that for you. Um, I'm quite happy to take any questions from the floor. Uh, you guys will get priority over what you asked yesterday. So if there is anything, please just stick your hand up. In the meantime, Chris. Yep. Um, is there any point in having in Field 18 IFPS rerouted accepted or route change or anything? Because we see this a lot because we've got the ACK uh, and the rejection now. No one is really looking at this manual message. So how would an operator who's struggling with a route, who's got an ACK, be advised there could be a better route? Do they speak to IFPS or what do they do? The IFPS route accepted is actually the, doesn't exist anymore because of our reject policy. It only exists for flights which are not directly rejected, like hospital flights, uh, search and rescue flights, and, and things like that, so special statuses. So for the rest, the IFPS RA has no sense to be filed at this moment for a normal, for a normal flight plan. So, so there's only one procedure left with IFPS RA that you file a DCT 1915, speed and level group, remark IFPSRA, 
and at that moment it, the system will automatically generate a routing for you and accept the flight plan as it finds one. That's the only use at this moment. I think more the question is, Mark, if a, an operator files, just gets an acknowledgement off a route that they don't like and they can't find anything else, what's the policy for contacting IFPS to help? You can, uh, you can call us. I'll write the number which is on your brochure there. You can send an email. Uh, or yeah, that's, uh, that's about it. When you call us, most of the time we will ask you to file a flight plan, even incorrectly because we need the aircraft data to make you a routing. Mm -hmm. And then, then you come to the solution that the previous person asked there. So then we have an originator address and we will re reply to you with a valid routing, with a route proposal. Mm -hmm. Or via email, we just reply via email. That's it. But be, sh be aware that the email is not constantly monitored. So the email is not constantly monitored, it's just a mailbox which is there, but it's not always someone sitting behind it and just waiting. It's not a help desk, as we should say. It's just a normal email, so it can take one hour, two hours. So when it's operationally urgent, give us a call. Okay? Uh, but file something before that, at least we have your aircraft data. Hmm? All right? So the, uh, What's the best way to file a, a, a flight plan that's not valid? Because when you have NMP, if, you, if it's not valid, you can't file to IFPS for Network Manager to see that. Is it just sending it through CETA or is it sending it like email, like you were saying, and follow up with a phone call? You can file it to the live system or you can file it to the IFPUV. We can retrieve your flight plans through the IFPUV as well. So if you do a test, even with a not valid routing, which should be possible via your flight planning system, we can retrieve your flight plan there, and from there on we can work and try to find you a routing, yes. Okay, so if you have your, your route and it's not valid, you hit the file to IFPS button on the free text, and it says rejected, yeah. you will still see that we'll on see your that, site. Yeah, yeah we'll okay. And from there on at least we have your equipment, we have all the data we need from your You have more information. Work on it, yeah. yeah. We, have your we have your aircraft type and everything is there. So otherwise okay. we can't really help you without anything. So we're working in the blind, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I have uh, a question from my, uh, my good friend from Sun Express. He's going to ask a question. Thank you very much, Chris. My last question, maybe, uh, next two days. Uh, uh, my question is regarding with the flight suspensions. Uh, we had a couple of uh, cases when the aircraft on, uh, in the air we got uh, information that flight suspended. And when we checked the log, flight log, we found out the local ATC suspended the flight plan. Is it possible, is it legal, to do, uh, when the aircraft uh, in flying and uh, suspend the fl flight plan? Thank you. Simon? Uh, I'm surprised by your comment that an aircraft already flying is getting suspended because the system will not do that. As soon as the flight is ATC activated, so we have confirmed airborne information. We will not suspend the flight anymore because we cannot suspend airborne flights. But local ATC sent the uh, suspension message to the uh, network management. No, L local ATC cannot send suspension messages. We opened the, we opened Only the incident. Only we are sending suspended. We suspension. opened the incident and we, when we checked the logs and we found out that last uh, information sent by the lo uh, local ATC. No, an FLS will only come from our system. So what, what I suggest we do with this one is uh, actually after this, perhaps you, if you want to follow up with Simon and we can go through it, but he's right, in, we, we are the only people that are actually able to send an FLS, so it might have been something different, but we're, we're more than happy to follow that up with you so we can get to the bottom of this particular issue. Simon, are you ready? Some of you may have noticed that, um, that our colleague Simon from Swiss has arrived, which I think is fantastic. It's, it must have been quite, a, quite an experience for you. So. Um, what, I w what I'm going to suggest is then we, we, we will, um, Simon will do his demonstration, presentation and demonstration. Um, then we'll obviously have some question and answers from him. Then I think we'll probably uh, be getting towards the wrap up time. We'll see how we're going for time. There may be a chance to, uh, to ask, ask, answer some more of these questions or any other questions that you have. Uh, but as I said before, I'm quite determined that we, uh, that we, we uh, finish on the uh, agreed time so that uh, your, sh your personal schedules aren't, aren't